I, I had a quite a good list, uh, quite an interesting list in radiology uh, on, oh, was it on Tuesday? Yes, I, uh, just in, in my local firm. There were just, just a couple of interesting scans and I don't even remember specifically what they were, but there was just, uh, just some stuff we saw uh, that caught my eye. And uh, I'll ask this. I was. I remember s scanning a patient where they were they were coming in for a little lump on their shoulder, and they had a little lump on their shoulder, which I've not got an image of because it was just a simple lipoma. Uh, but then I saw this in. Uh, can you see this here? Yeah. It just. It almost looks like muscle. It's in infraspinatus. And the patient couldn't feel it. Okay, just a second, John. At the very top of that, that's the deltoid. Is that correct? The deltoid. The skin, adipose, deltoid, and then this is the space that you're saying would be infraspinatus next. Am I seeing yes. am I seeing the, the humeral head to the right there? No, you're not seeing I'll just okay. go back to this one. This is I just literally took a couple of clips, a couple of uh, and they're just stills. Uh, okay. but this is within the infraspinatus muscle. Okay. And it's just an intramuscular lipoma. Huh. We but know that because it's a homogenous echo texture, it isn't having the f fascicles of, of it, muscle? It, to be honest, I didn't see it at first. It just didn't quite look like normal muscle. So this is normal muscle here. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it just had a slightly different shape. Just caught my eye a couple of times I went through it and I thought, and I thought it just looked like muscle. And then I noticed, and, and then when I really said, I'm not entirely happy with that, I went backwards and forwards, and it sort of formed, and yeah, so yeah, muscle, muscles always going to somewhere or coming from something, and this just it isn't. And I just took a couple of votes. Uh, I didn't, I couldn't get a cine loop of it, but uh, but this, and there it is. And you just, it's just subtle, and you know, she'll go, the patient will go the rest of their life without it, it mattering because uh, they didn't he couldn't even notice it but you just you know it's it's good to see stuff now john when you say that um are you because you're processing differential diagnoses that involve this soft tissue you are already marginalizing any kind of sinister activity on this because it has all the markings of a lipoma and does not have any of the markings that could be metastatic or 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 anything like that. Do you then have the liability of if at a year from now it is in fact something different um, than that that you you have looked at this? Would would there be liability with you on that? Or what what point do you go to? Um, Doppler? Are you just? This is what's amazing to me, John. I would, they would put, that, I would put Doppler on it as a matter of course. So you did? Oh, you mean the next time it came in? No, no. As I would do, you know, the, you scan when when you scan any of these things, you look carefully through it in grayscale. You get a the, the information you can from the grayscale. Then you put the Doppler on, and you examine it with the Doppler. When you say in a matter of course, you mean as a normal process of you screening normal tissue. Yeah. So this one, you you would also, as a process of fully clearing it, have looked for that. Yes. Yeah. You would. If you, you would. would have seen just a general distribution or no real activity at all, it would go into the category of that's what I thought. But if it had singular vascularity. Uh, tell me what you're processing. I would I, I would look at something like this, and I would you know look look at it, look at its shape, look at its size, uh, and you know for something like this, which is it's quite unusual to be looking at a lump the patient hasn't hasn't directed you to. Yes. Uh, but presuming they had directed you to it, you'd look at it, you'd ask them whether it was getting bigger, you'd ask them whether it was painful. And you would you would you would scan it. You would look to see whether there was any color flow in it, and uh, and depending on where it was and what it looked like, you would 
take into account what color flow you took. So uh, something like something this size uh, with uh, with a, an architecture that looks like a lipoma doesn't have any sinister areas, uh, and I would expect it not to have any vascularity in it. If it had vascularity in it, it would still be a lipoma to me, but it would be a lipoma that I would probably suggest that the doctors had a closer look at, maybe did a different study, maybe considered taking out. Very good. You know, so because, because lipomas can have blood flow in them and, and liposarcomas often, when they arise, they start off as lipomas. So they are a lipoma and then they, then they change. You know too much about the periphery of this stuff, man. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just what you do all day, every day. I understand. All right. <laughs> I, take me, take I, my I don't know, I don't know anything about rehabbing stuff people anymore. <laughs> um, what's interesting is that you basically said he'll never feel this um, uh, or, or it won't become an issue to him. Uh, are we talking age wise, middle age? Are we talking later, uh, is it 60 years old, or what were we talking here? I honestly can't remember. I, th okay. I think relatively young, but but this okay. is still, you know, that that could well not change for uh, another fifty years. So, hey, while I have you on this subject, before you go to the next thing, and, and I'm loving this stuff, um, I got an email just actually within about ten minutes before I I, I clicked on this uh, uh, from a innovator um, uh, individual who is looking at a tool that they want me to zoom on that gives actual numbers to muscle thickness. Uh, I, I don't really understand what he's, what he's doing, but he's, he's an okay guy. So I'll give him some zoom time. But what his question came down to one of the people who are doing the study do MRIs of um, fat within muscles. Uh, and he was talking about how the MRIs that the radiologist was doing um, were of the, uh, rotator cuff muscles, and he was asking me whether or not uh, that I'm aware or do I have any information with regard to assessing the muscles of the rotator cuff for fat. And, and, and I know at least research-wise, there's a criteria of some sort that doctors will look at fatty infiltration, and I would imagine the supraspinatus or infraspinatus to evaluate the viability of a rotator cuff repair. Am I, yeah. am I right? And is that part of your process in scanning mm -hmm. for rotator cuff is saying, hey, it's More torn, so let me look at the, the fat yeah. content? Yeah, yeah. Not, I, there, are, there are papers on it, and I have passed my eye over them. I haven't taken them uh, to heart in any detail. I just use the Mark One eyeball and, uh, uh, and look at it and see whether it's smaller uh, than the other side, smaller than I would expect it to be, but also just get a sense of the epitexture, you know, whether it's a nice, rich sort of steak-like muscle or whether it looks like the sort of thing that you're going to have to cook for three hours to... <laughs> Gamey. <laughs> well, but no, gamey would not have a lot of fat in it, right? We're not—we're oh, we're talking like Kobe beef or something like that, where they massage the cows and all that kind of stuff. That yeah. that that would look a lot more cloudy, a lot more white, a lot more bright. Uh, when the, I'm just trying to think, uh, somewhere, somewhere I'll have uh, something else. Uh, somewhere I'm sure I've got some images. Yeah. Of, I would, I would love you, to see you. If you put a probe onto an 80-year-old man and look at his calf muscle, it does not look have that same echo texture that the uh, that, that, that a young sporting uh, calf muscle has. It is much more fibrous, much brighter, much much less much less of the dark, much more of the bright, and that's much, what you get from filtration. Much more likely to require a. Um a pressure cooker if you're going to actually be eating that particular. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay. I, so, so I eyeball that and, and I mention it, uh, how seriously anybody takes my, my comments. I don't know. I don't really worry too much about it. 
Um, I think, you know, certainly this position in the UK at the moment is is one of uh, most anything close to routine surgical wise is is on hold anyway. So, uh, as a function so, of COVID or as a function of the NHS, function of COVID's effect on the NHS. Okay. Um, I, in 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 the US obviously it's a fight between the aggressive orthopedic surgeon and insurance companies that don't want to pay for a botched uh, or a failed rotator cuff so the yeah. better the n or, or or the better the research on on the studies that show that if there's a certain grayscale they're not going to pay for the the rotator cuff surgery to be, to be done you know that that that's what we deal with over here uh, you're on the other side of the equation i would imagine where if it was a 75 percent tear uh, of a young individual and, and you know that's when they would consider doing it as opposed to you know this person's 75 years old it's a half of their tendon and 80 percent of the people have those major tears anyway anyway i don't want to get off on that subject i'm ready to listen to your next case here <laughs> yeah uh, next case this was this probably less obvious from the picture this was, this was quite an interesting case where uh, and i won't go too much into the detail but uh, they'd had surgery on their leg and uh, and the muscle had been cut during the surgery it was for necrotizing fasciitis and uh, and you then had and within the defect of the muscle and i didn't know where I, it was hard to actually get a decent picture. This is a short axis. It's hard to believe. Ah, it's this like a, like a hernia of, of, of yeah. the muscle up through the... But, it, but not of muscle. Oh. See, the muscle, the, uh, a muscle hernia, this is, this is the border of the muscle, yeah? Yes. Or would be. That's where the, the defect is. But in a muscle hernia, this would typically all be muscle. But what's happened is they've had uh, surgical trauma to the muscle for whatever reason, when they've cut, cut, cut in, uh, and they've damaged the muscle, and fat has grown in the space. And so there was a classic hernia defect, but it was actually a plug, and that's where these pictures, slightly more bizarre pictures, that's a plug of, this is all muscle here, not very well taken picture, and then this is a plug of fat, I am long axis on the fascicles of the muscle, and that's a yes. plug of fat that I'm looking at that is projecting up through the paramyceum, whatever that wrapping is on the outside yes. of the muscle. And again, it's the way that you basically said that this is fat makes yeah. me know that you've locked onto the echo texture or, or, or the way that's presenting itself and and – and I should be ashamed of myself to infer that it's a muscle hernia. Again, it would have been it would have been the ability to say, Greg, can't you see that that's a glob of fat? <laughs> well, exactly. Can't you see? <laughs> okay. Uh, we would expect, if it were muscular, for us to have the uh, dark and bright texture of muscle. Yeah. And if we changed on the orthogonal, we would be able to see the definition of that in yeah. different perspective. In this particular one, both sides or both uh, cuts are the same. All right, that's valuable to me. This this was a very messy uh, uh, peroneus longus and brevis. Longus, and you see how brevis is curled around it. Yeah. And have, have you sent, have you scanned this um, often with per, uh, the peroneal tendons? Uh, they should sit like a like a ball and a, and a tadpole underneath. So, so peroneus longus is, an, is, is a reasonably well-formed tendon as it approaches the ankle. Peroneus brevis is still this, uh, this mus uh, muscular tendinous junction, this aponeurosis that thickens up as it approaches the malleolus. As it goes round the malleolus, it should, be, it should sit underneath the longus tendon. But in a lot of cases, it becomes uh, uh, abnormal and sort of subluxes up beside the peroneus longus and becomes thickened and irregular. Um, here it is coming round. So you've got the longus here and the brevis should still sit underneath it, but it's pushed up beside it. 
and it's flattened into almost a C shape. Are we approaching the uh, calcaneofibular uh, ligament? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. That, okay. That's going to pop in just, just below there. But what you're pointing out is that the actual morphology of the brevis is showing that it is it is pushing up against that retinaculum, uh, and 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 it just does not look normal. Yeah. And there's fluid, reactive fluid around it, or is that not so much a, an issue? Well, the amount of fluid isn't huge, but but you just see the boundary itself is actually irregular, and as you would expect, a certain amount of synovitis with it. This is that synovial thickening? Would would, would you yeah. call that thickening? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then this was was what would made this case. And and this is one that would have would have been better with a with a cine loop, but this is all brevis. This is a, a slice through. If you imagine this long section here, imagine a long section through this, and then and when you see it, the, the next picture, you'll see that this bit of the tendon is normal. This bit, which relates to the front part, the anterior portion. When I went when I followed it back into the into the muscular tendinous junction, it was the fibres that anteriorly that are almost like imagine the front of supraspinatus the thicker punch there and then the thinner bunch the thinner fibers here when you see them in long axis because i'm slicing straight through there see the thin fiber that the, the posterior fibers which are now here are actually in perfect nick look beautiful and the superficial the anterior fibers looks retracted well, it is, but it isn't. These actually flow in, and the tendon became absolutely normal distally. So you get this mush-like effect, where they, where all that fibrillar pattern is just, just lost. And you see that sometimes in Achilles, when when Achilles is grossly abnormal, grossly tendinotic, you start to lose that fibrillar pattern. But it's still, but the but the overall structure, the superstructure of the tendon seems to remain intact. And that's what's happening here. And, you know, that, that is just a very, very unhappy, messy tendon. But it was just unusual. I don't think I've ever picked it out quite so clearly. But actually, one part of the tendon, a bit like sometimes supraspinatus, is yeah. just one part. And, and that there are actually two parts of the tendon that are behaving very, very differently. And it was just... What it means, I don't know, but it was it. It I scanned it, and and that's what it looked like. And this was this is actually that bit there is actually that healthy bit of the tendon, and this is what it looked like when it wasn't being pressed round the malleolus. So the malleolus was squishing that abnormal bit, which is presumably soft and and very pliable. And as it came out of that tight space, pressed by the longus, which I think is this figure just here it's low echo it was it very very mushy just the architecture is completely lost inside it but not actually torn and not split which is what you often see you so were seeing this because they had pain there though was that right or was it instability yeah. or yeah they were pain pain and swelling um it is amazing to me again it seems as though that there are several occasions, including even the gluteus medius, that has that almost backup, um, non-aggressive tendon like we have on the supraspinatus as well. It's almost like there's a backup, like a fuse, <laughs> that if there's excess pressure, there, that there's a almost a, 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 a relief zone, uh, like a crumple zone or, or, or whatever, to increase the amount of distance that we have a compromise, you know, so that we don't tear the whole thing. It, it, it's, it's fascinating like, like this. Yeah. In this yeah. region, John, can you talk me through one of those prior images as to what you would expect to see if the retinaculum was torn and, and let's say we now have a dislocating perineal group? Um, Look here, where is it, this one? Yeah. So, so this picture here is probably 
probably just below. I may not have picked them out in the right order. Uh, so you got the the retinaculum is probably this piece here. Yeah. Yeah. Coming around, and and when you strain the tendon, so one, I usually scan these. Uh, my my approach to scanning ankles, uh, you might have seen on videos and things, is uh, you know I scan the front of the ankle with a patient lying on their back with the heel just over the end of the bench. As soon as I'm looking at the lateral side, unless it's something really easy and quick where you just go and look anyway, I roll them onto their side. So I roll the patient onto their onto their left side if you're looking at the right ankle, uh, right ankle, uh, and then with the foot just on the edge of the bed or sitting on the other foot, uh, one uh, sort of shelled inside the other. And then you can do your resisted tests quite easily as you're scanning. Because I sit at the end of the bed when I do feet. So I just tuck myself at the end of the bed. The patient, they don't sit up with a foot, foot on the bed. They, they actually have their foot just off the end of the bed uh, or sitting on something. And then you've got some some ability, some ability just to move it up and down, and then you can get them to do their eversion, so resisted eversion, and and you should see the the tendon sublux or dislocate, and you can certainly at that point you are stressing the retinaculum, and you should be able to see if there is any weakness there or any failure of it structurally. If you saw any chips that were avulsed. If you did not, I mean, if, if there was fluid and, and, and that type of thing, and then did your dynamic testing and saw them both flop on top of the, um, on top of the tibia or, or whatever, uh, that's where we would be starting to go, well, that's fairly definitive that we have um, that, that torn. John, I want to back up just a second. You seem to imply that there were some videos out there of you doing this. Now, you know I have every video that sauna hacked has done and i have yet to see the john letty the full feature film john letty ankle where are you talking about that i would be having access to this i, video? I think no just one of those videos i did for the uh, cfl and atfl ligaments and there oh. i've got the paper lying on the side when i yeah, scanned but I, I haven't gone through the entire protocol twirl a patient a video that that he needs to do uh, for that. So it's not like I've missed some core curriculum. No. <laughs> okay. No, we <laughs> okay. We've, we, we, we've been tardy. We haven't been doing any videos recently. So. Well, you've, we 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 have a world as a world have gone through a little bit of a distraction here. Yeah. Are you guys? Uh, I mean, I'm assuming you're 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 masking and 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 uh, what other has it disrupted your cue? Uh, or your list in half, or are you up to eighty percent or a hundred percent now of what you guys were doing? No, I'm 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 up to a hundred percent now of what I'm doing, and I wear face mask, uh, and we're talking about wearing. Uh, I think sometimes we wear visors. I'm not very keen on them because I can't really see the screen through the visors particularly well. But uh, but yes, it's we're supposed to be mask and visor, and and, and we wear. Uh, simple gowns, you know, just the the plastic pull on ones, and then gloves. After so each gloves. patient, you you go through one of those, or or how does that actually work? We we, we change we keep uh, retain the mask and and any visor, uh, and and you just strip off the cheap plastic thing uh, and the gloves. Wow. Prior to that, it was simply wash hands and, and go from one patient to the next. Yeah, yeah, which is which is fine. You know those seats. Uh, you know for, for what we're doing. You yeah, know, you, absolutely. You think those things. All right, I'm ready for my next one. Yeah, I'm just trying to see what else. Oh, this is the same. This is the same study. Yeah, this is just uh, a little bit of blood flow there, uh, and I think that's probably the same one. Yeah, it was just. I thought it was quite cool, so I took a few pictures. Yeah, there. That, that shows better. Yes. The way it's normal tent, normal part of the brevis and the abnormal part of the brevis. So I, I, I hadn't reviewed these before you, you took them. This was a lacrimum bursa. Oh, bursa. Yeah. yeah. With some, actual uh, complex junk inside of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But this was this was a good one in that the patient came for the scan, had had one on each elbow, booked the scan or 
went to the doctor who who sent uh, sent the request through and in the intervening time they just went away so these are these are collapsed ones he said they were like golf balls on his elbow and uh, patients are always asking for them to be drained and i'm always telling them you know just give it a couple more weeks they'll probably just go away on their own how how hard are you to uh to to, to say that if i if i really started to whine and stuff would you start pulling on it or are you going to just say i'm not going to do it the risk of actually opening that sucker up and infecting you is beyond what i want to take well pretty pretty much well we uh, we have a discussion because (laughs) if if they they understand the if they understand the risks and they really want to get rid of it and uh uh then i will often often it doesn't happen often but the attitude is you know so long as they understand the risk and consent to them uh, and it's a reasonable thing to do then then i will do it uh, give them some relief but uh but i do explain to them that this is something that the vast majority of patients goes away uh, you can do a little bit to help it happen and and it is a very relatively high risk of infection because of the wrinkliness of the skin we think well that's my my take on it you know your skin's really wrinkly it's really hard to make sure that something an area that wrinkly you actually get all the bugs out so they're going to go inside it's a lovely place for bugs to breed because you know there's like nice damp area that doesn't have a lot of direct blood flow you know you could you could you could put them in a petri dish and they would probably breed quicker but they, they <laughs> feel pretty good a pretty good warm place for them to <laughs> to do their magic so and you know you you you, you sell it that but if it's bothering them enough it's still a small risk of it happening and if you take the care and you don't put any steroid in, you see, I will do these things and I, it's like ganglions. I'm for patients are forever asking me, well, are you going to use some local anesthetic? And I say, no. And I say, because I ask every patient afterwards whether they thought I should have done. And they go, no, that was fine. And uh, every, every, everyone I know does sort of local anesthetic sprays and things, you know, with a lot of these things, putting the local anesthetic in is as painful or more painful than me just putting the needle through a sensible place and just taking the stuff out. And you reduce a lot of the background, not very high, but background risks associated with it, you know. And you can cut out a little bit of time in your procedure. It it makes it a much tidier procedure and simple is good. Yeah. And and, and the more simple it is, the less stressful it is for for the clinician, though, you know, I do do these all day, so that's less of an issue, but it makes it, that's much more, much less stressful for the patient in actual fact. You know, it's a nice clean, spend, I spend the time on cleaning the structure and I try and I think it's from a safety point of view, you know, in terms of infection control, the most important thing to do is make the procedure simple because simple things, less prone to error, less complication, less prone to uh, outside infection and everybody makes mistakes. In, in whatever process they do, uh, particularly if they're expected to talk at the same time. So the yeah. simpler you make it, the less actual risk there is. So I now, things. You had said some people spray stuff. Is that like that ethyl chloride or fluoromethane or whatever? Or what? what, what uh, they that use that super evaporate. It, it evaporates really fast and, and just basically desensitizes. Is that what you're talking about? Or... I'm not sure that patients are always telling me people used a spray and I, and people use cold sprays and all sorts of things. Uh, and it just le- adds a level of complication compared to a simple puncture uh, done reasonably. Um, you feel it a lot less putting a needle in feels a lot less if it's done reasonably quickly. You don't want to be stabbing people going too far, but if you've got the right needle size and the rest of it, and and you've got good control when you puncture through a boundary quickly it hurts a lot less than if you go through slowly uh so if you can make a short jab into something and the less stressful it is you, you say something funny uh just before it goes in if <laughs> if that's appropriate so just take the mind away oh yeah sharp scratch boom and then they go out jobber game over I want to learn from you. I have to try to justify 
doing that because I have no credentials over here, one of the ways that I, I can truly justify it is if I'm helping other people over here, I really do need to at least understand that. So I'm trying to work on the logistics of trying to justify that financially to get over there. However, I'm going to go back to your, uh, your, your, your Pernius Brevis um, patient. Did you inject in that? It's a diagnostic scan. So, and it I wasn't even, they, they weren't even coming to you to inject it. And if you were, if, if they were coming to you and to inject it, what would you have told them? Uh, they, they shouldn't be coming to me to inject it because I wouldn't inject it. They had a, they, they came with a swelling. So I wouldn't uh, routinely, uh, even if someone's coming to find out what the swelling is. Uh, it's in a tendon. We are very, um, very anti-injecting steroids around tendons. It's uh, it's uh, very discouraged in the UK, certainly. Uh, you've got that's when you yeah. sell your PRP for about eight hundred bucks, John. That's when What's you that? pull out your little spinner and you say, yeah. "Oh yeah, watch this." <laughs> yeah, and, and and some of my friends do do that, uh, but uh, they are um, and 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 there may be a role for that. I certainly in, in my sort of NHS practice, it's it's not practiced. Uh, yeah. But if it, in terms of you wanting to do an intervention that might help here, I can see where they're coming from for for using that. But for this sort of tendon where it's in this sort of state, all you're going to do is, I think, is take away any chance of that healing. You're going to weaken that to the point where that bit is going is just going to go. Is if that you, always that if thing? you do a corticosteroid in, if you into do that? Corticosteroid thing. I think I think you are you are compromising what is already pretty compromised. It's time and to just let nature do its thing, and that's when you refer to my clinics and say, "I think he needs at least six visits for him to do his little ice and scraping and stretching and you strengthening and acting like you're doing something that makes it better in time." Yep, yep. I think I think that's that's exactly right, and uh, and you know you you do. Uh, you can think about uh, doing things like uh, putting putting some volume in there. Uh, if if it really needs settling down, pain control, I might try and put a little bit of a mixture of uh, uh, local anaesthetics in there. Now, the local anaesthetics are not entirely good for tendons either, but uh, but I think, uh, relatively speaking, I think that their negative effects are relatively minor. Uh, you but use the term volume, volume, John. John. You, yeah. you said, but is are, is that a word to say I would put it, some injectate in there, or are you literally saying I'd like to stretch the structure? Well, I I, I would like to. Uh, they call it hydrodissection, all sorts of things, or, or or a stripping technique. But you know, you you put something in there and you just allow some fluid to push the bound boundaries apart, uh, so they don't adhere. That's what you would have in in your iman. That would, that's what would be exercising your imagination. Yeah. Um, and uh, what actually happens in practice, you know, heaven only knows. Yeah. But you're doing something, and people you're, like that. You're doing something. You're calming. You're doing yeah. something that calms it down uh, and gives the patient some relief, allows it to move more freely. Uh, and I think these are reasonable and and, and valid things to do. Uh, when there's not much else you can do. And, Excellent. And then, uh, but yes, in terms of actually promoting healing in, a, in something like this, I think we are, we're not there yet in terms of knowing what actually turns these, uh, these very abnormal tendons around, if indeed anything does. That sort of study's not been done, as far as I'm aware, where people have looked at um, these relatively uncommon uh, sort of outliers in terms of uh, tendon pathology. Well, I enjoyed your yin and the yang case there. I can see the, I, I can see that, uh, that, that, <laughs> but, but the takeaway for me is, is the fact that there appears to be a central cord within the perineus brevis with a secondary, almost fascial um, a, a slip uh, much like um, in, in the uh, supraspinatus, and I didn't even know that that existed uh, anyway. But but yeah. anyway, so talk to me about the next one. 
Uh, I think this is less exciting. This is just a little lipoma. Um, but little something orient, orient me. Are we are, are we deltoid? Are we gastroc? Yes, or deltoid. In fact, it may well be the same patient that had a, has had a little muscular lipoma. It's the week. one that came in that just likes growing lipomas. This is the one you could see. Yeah, this is Don't the one that, that they could feel. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not simple. seeing. I'm not seeing the amount of floated gel on top there, John. I, I I'm, uh, but but we're not looking for vascular flow here either. We're just no. looking for visualizing it amongst the adipose cells that are there. Yeah, I'd, I I use the standoff uh, if I'm if I'm looking for a hernia, and and I think I'm pressing on it or uh, or something like that. Uh, if I was looking at the perineals lifting over. Just the probe pressure might stop that. So a little uh, layer of jelly will make a difference there. But uh, uh, which one? This this was a. Um, do you want to guess what this that is? No, I hate doing that because I get so far off that you yeah. you go. Who this is, is this nut? <laughs> <laughs> this is um, uh, just above the medial malleolus. On uh, a, is a um, a swollen. Uh, tenosynovitis uh, from a tibialis posterior. Huh. And the, you, you, you see the the fat around it is also a little bit unhappy, but uh, I'm not. I, don't, I wouldn't draw any specific conclusions from there. And there is the vascularity, a little bit in the tendon, which isn't that swollen. But there, this was this was a curious case because there was. Synovitis, and in, as in tenosynovitis, the yes. tendon was not that abnormal, but it had, but it actually had, and I don't know whether I got a oh. picture. Oh, yes! Wow! Vascularity tracking along inside the tendon, and Within there the is the fibers of the tendon. Yes, there's a, a vessel, a, a, a tortuous vessel running through the fibers of the tendon. Huh? And uh, you know quite what was going on there i don't think i got to the bottom of but uh, but yes it was a yeah tibia a sort of pattern of sort of less dramatic tendinosis in the tendon and then the classic tenosynovitis around it with a small effusion um is that um that uh, um flexor digitorum beyond it and further up toward the uh the the yeah there that thing, no, that's a little bit of fluid in the sub. This is all subcutaneous fat here. Gotcha. Really would love, really would love to have you try to pull out some of your tarsal tunnel imaging for me, John. I'm, uh, that's going to be a passion of mine this next week. I'm going to try to scan as many normals as I can because, you know, that whole what are they, uh, Mickey Mouse uh, vessels and the and, and the tibial nerve and, and all that kind of stuff. I, I I I believe I have a patient with bilateral that. And, and so I need to get oriented a little bit more. But um, that yeah. the um, posterior tibialis, though, is is the Tom of the Tom, Dick, and Harry. Is that not correct? Yeah. 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 All right. So you had some things you wanted to go through. Sorry, um, I've not no, I, I, I just, I would almost prefer that because I learned so much with that. And I don't want to, I mean, I, I don't want you to feel bored if all you're doing is teaching me or showing me some cool studies because that really is a value to me. Um, I'm, I'm only going to, I'll just verbally reference with you uh, three things I wanted to talk about. One is I sent you some information on the WhatsApp thing regarding this uh, um, uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis. And it looked to me like the research article was really almost promoting um, a certain brand. Let me see if I can share this with you. See if it shows up. Let me pull down here, here. I don't know whether or not you able to see that. It, does that fill up your full screen or, or, or do you see that? Can you see me moving? Yep. Um, this, is, this is an article that seems to uh, talk about a sub coracoid fat triangle and yeah. it was talking about if i can take it up here a little bit that imaging component um, i don't have the ability on my ipad to, to point at anything in particular i don't believe but right. this just looks like the coracochromial ligament under which is is i've just never heard 
on the upper image, you see what they're referring to as the subcoracoid triangle, fat triangle, or or, or yeah. whatever. It looks like it's that tissue, that that um, echoic tissue, or that bright tissue under the coracohumeral ligament, um, yeah. and 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 it shows up um, like there is some vascularity in that. And in the article, it references the fact that. They did. They do know that the uh, inferior capsule thickening and something that changes on the interval view. I think they're also talking about neovascularity at the interval view, but that this is this is a point um, of scan that at least their wonder tool of being able to evaluate this hypervascularity uh, did show some. I don't know sensitivity or, or something like that. I've just never have have seen that fat pad uh, or, or that fat area and I was just curious to know uh, I think again we're seeing uh, that that uh, and then down here um, I think this is what you and I had talked about I think maybe even last year when I sent you a picture of what I thought to be a coracal humeral ligament and it's it's dark because of the anisotropy effect on it diving down to the humerus right in that yeah. top right one. Yeah. So I guess as it's, we're looking it may at this also be edematous. Say that again. If it is thickened, it may also be a degree of edema as well. But 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 essentially you should be suspicious of uh, uh, sort of calling it edema when it's not parallel. Oh, you're I see. We could call the coracohumeral ligament edematous, or or having effusion within those fibers. Uh, but but in order to be able to truly use that term, you need to be parallel to the fibers to make sure that it's not just uh, yeah. a, a, an enlarged uh, fibrous structure, but that it actually ho holds fluid. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. let's talk. Briefly about the um, um, just adhesive capsulitis, uh, you do diagnostic scans, and do they come to you queued up with, I think this is adhesive capsulitis, or are they coming to you queued up with, there's shoulder pain here, John, you're going to first have to scan to see if there's any glaring lesions, and then take them through, do they have external rotation limited or abduction limited, and then do you do an axial uh, scan as part of your process? and and to what extent do you do this vast this Doppler assessment at the interval view or at this triangle to determine that? What, what, what's that process? I've not seen this paper before. Uh, I look routinely at this at, in this plane uh, and assess the coracohumeral ligament. So I look at the coracohumeral ligament in the same plain as these guys are looking, looking not at it. measuring it because you're looking for just how it appears to you compared to other coracal humeral ligaments or compared to the 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 uh, contralateral side a mixture of both and uh, and how it moves dynamically how it moves dynamically when you do what <laughs> I, rotate, I, I rotate the arm and in my sort of heath, what we'd call a heath robinson approach is is I look at it, I see if it's thickened, see if it's actually continuous with the uh, pectoralis minus minor tendon, which it often is, uh, and uh, and look at uh, look at when you externally rotate the arm, whether it tightens up, and quite you know like a like a piece of rope tightening. Yeah just as they reach the end of range. And that would show uh, you normal, or that would show you that it has restricted, or, or that it would be more well, adhesed? If, well, if, no, if the patient is, uh, I don't think there are any adhesions in adhesive capsulitis. Uh, so uh, it's, or I've, I've never seen anything that justifies that term. So I just call it a frozen shoulder. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but the, um, but, the thing that's making you suspicious of a frozen shoulder is the fact they have reduced external rotation. Yes. So, uh, so, and we would, and we would expect then as they're getting to like 30 degrees or less that this becomes taut. Yeah. And, and, and quite deliberately. So, you know, it's, it, it's physically, what does a rope look like as it tightens? It? Yes. The stretching out or do you, 
does it go and go and then it and then almost flicks straight is so there you, other windows you use besides this to confirm well, that oh uh, well i i i sometimes in the older patients with uh, that look like they've got a frozen shoulder particularly if i can't see and and, and in some patients uh with frozen shoulder this that the ligament isn't tightened it, it it is not the restrict it is not the thick and restricted thing it's it seems to me very much like a, a sort of dupatron's contracture uh the frozen shoulder and so it's uh, uh what you get is the and i think histologically it's it's almost identical but uh but it's uh, thickening uh, but it doesn't have to be as with dupatron's it isn't just one bit there are bits that most commonly get suffer from it but it isn't the bit it, it isn't always the same bit. I scanned someone a couple of days ago where it was on their little finger just here, the Dupatrons. Yeah. Uh, but so does du does Dupatrons have the classic thawing phase or are you just saying the way no. it presents itself? No, the, well, I th as far as I'm aware, the histology is, is very similar or the same. But so that we can have maybe a Dupatrons coming and going. Uh, we just don't really have a problem until it starts to actually lock down. I suspect so, but I, but that that's um, the root. Uh, but if you think about Dupatrons in the foot, it doesn't give a problem at all in the vast majority of patients, and we and we put that down to the fact that it's it's being heavily stretched all the time, and yet we don't have a great deal of success stressing um, uh, stretching frozen shoulder. But is that because you're str in in frozen shoulder you're stretching a, an essentially a very unstable structure so when you try to stretch something with a focal restriction then you get you, you get secondary uh, sort of uh, yeah non-physiological movement of the humeral head which then causes pain and and suffering uh which you don't get in the foot fascinating yeah. uh, fibromatosis or actually du dupatrins because i I'm ignorant enough to say I don't know that I've ever called anything in the foot Dupertrans. Well, I, well, it's not the right term, but but it is the. But it, I understand it what you're same, saying. It's the okay. same disease. But very just, good. You know. When when we are looking at adhesive capsulitis, and it looks like we have several windows and several structures that we're looking at for its thickeningness and its hyper um, uh, vascularity ness. Um, Yet I'm seeing uh, interventionalists do their hydro dissection or whatever we call that, most of it to the CHL, after which they claim these phenomenal releases of people's range of motion that are now able to open up and, and all that kind of stuff. I don't get it. Can you, uh, is, do you see this miraculous value from injecting just the CHL? No, I, I, and I'm not sure. I don't know anyone who... Well, I don't know, injecting the CHL. I don't know anyone personally who does a procedure directly at the CHL. Some the of dilation, my, the, the, the release they're talking about uh, at, ah, uh, okay. No, there, are, there, there was a fashion of, uh, a couple of years ago for doing their, your, an anterior, a front uh, entrance uh, injection in the interval for your, uh, uh, for your hydro. Uh, distension ah uh, again working working its way up there a little bit but 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 procedurally what you are doing is you are putting your fluid into the joint and you're choosing your window i don't know anyone who tries to do a release of the um, an, an actual release uh under ultrasound of the coracohumeral ligament and I, and it's not something that makes any sense to me all right uh, I, I have I have two names in particular that I, I, I think can go back to something, and that's what kind of made me wonder. I do know, what about putting in an extra volume just within the, the, the capsule itself? And I that's mean, what like, most people are doing. And, and that would have been done at the interval you're talking about, or is that an axillary approach? Um, local to us published a paper uh, going through the interval to, to do that. Uh, I don't. I'd go in from the back of the joint uh at the, the interval is from the experience of my colleagues who who tried it they find it much more uncomfortable for the patient yeah and i don't really see the point uh and i by, don't 
by interval, you're you're talking, or by the back of the joint, you're talking about like at the glenoid um, um, entry uh, back yeah. there. Glenoid two additional glenoid. two additional things, because I'm hearing a squeaking of a door there, uh, John, and I'm getting a little paranoid about your time. So yeah. I, I I will say, um, um, actually. Apparently it's down to one because it left my mind <laughs> the other one. I'm going to be using the 20 megahertz uh, Clarius to do some comparative scans on a number of people that are coming in on hands and feet, and and you know they're they're claiming that the the newest uh, uh, ultra high resolution scanner is imaging blood flow at 0.3 millimeters, and and you know I I just I I, I am. I am intrigued to hear your take on the so whatness of that, be, 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 because I don't. I mean, as as a therapist or as a an MSK a point of care ultrasound consumer, I really would like to hear like to what extent Doppler sensitivity matters to you, or whether or not just the resolution of interface perception and, and how small that is matters. Um, I'm not that fussed about the, um, the resolution, the spatial resolution. That's right. That's right. I think what we have is very good in terms of outright of in-plane spatial resolution on most scanners is, is good. The contrast resolution is what you pay for. So, so the, I need to play there again. Because yeah, I remember the, spending yeah, the, some time the, in that. The spatial resolution is down to the freq frequency. The yes, 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 resolution yes. is down to the frequency and the size of the crystals. Uh, and yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How far away the part there. Yeah. How well, how tight the beam is. Uh, so, so that's majority of that is build quality. Once you get below, above about 10 megahertz, you're not, re you'll get, you're down in the 0.2 of a millimeter range. So yes, when when we start looking into hands and being able to look at the slips, that will get better if the contrast resolution, if it can tell the difference between dif subtle differences in bright, that will matter. Uh, that will be good and it will be nice. And it's the same with the color. It's all very well seeing more, but it's how reliably you see it and how well you see it through multiple depths. Uh, and then it's just about calibrating and how clinically significant it is because are we the question to why i would spend more money on better color uh seeing smaller amounts of of blood flow in if you think if if you're they're saying their machine will show it when when you wouldn't see it before because there was less of it then you're saying well that's that would be useful if I am not, if I'm not seeing very, very low levels of inflammation that that are clinically relevant, and that's that then becomes important because if your machine is is sensitive enough to see when it's an inflammatory arthropathy, or when there's tenosynovitis, when there's uh, neovascularity in your say your uh, tennis elbow, uh, if that's going to change your management, then then it'd be useful. To be honest, I'm my clinical skills and my clinical uh, judgments are not. I don't think if if there was more sensitivity, I would just have to learn a different sen a, a different uh, implication of it, because I'd be picking up smaller and smaller amounts. And right now, if I pick up any, then I think it's clinically relevant. But if they're showing me even less, I'm going to start <laughs> to see some, a lot more physiological stuff. And I'm going to have to then get, because basically if it shows up on my kit, then it's pathological. If it doesn't show up on my kit, then it's probably not significant. So yeah, we've it makes got, perfect sense um, to me. Yeah, at the moment, makes I've got sense. quite a nice match. Now, if, if they were being able to do that at a lower frequency, improve the sensitivity at a lower frequency, so I could see... Uh, maybe the vascularity in a, a uh, hip capsule. When when you're looking at the hip capsule, and you know the Doppler's pretty much I put it on, but I can't. I, I, I I'm pretty sure there's some vascular activity down there, but it is too far away through too complicated tissue, and no useful signal is coming back at me. That would be something I might pay for. <laughs> 